Hello, please. Okay, thanks, Gregory. Good afternoon and welcome to the session B of the meeting. We are a bit uh, uh, below schedule, so let's start uh, immediately with the uh, one view with two predictions of supernova. The one view, are you online? And if yeah. you the presenter status. Okay. okay, you can share your screen. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'll give you warning at uh, five minutes. I you think start. everything's okay now, yes? Yes, yes. Okay. So I'm okay. Start now. So my title is a predictions of supernova, and uh, there are two examples. We will have more time, I, but possibly I will not have. And we talk about another work about testing the standard model AGM by deep learning. So next slide. The first one: the predictions of supernova. A binary system is very common in the universe because we know most of stars are in the binary. And in some cases, there are one a neutron star with another stripped core that is a, a carbon oxygen, iron oxygen core. They locate in a very narrow distance. So what will happen, what will occur in such a system? So here is a small cartoon. At the above, we see initially there are two stars, a massive star that is an iron core and a, a neutron star there. So the binary, so following the onset where this massive star will go on to a supernova explosion. And following the onset of this supernova, but usually the supernova type 1b or type 1c, a hypercritical accretion process of the supernova ejector until the neutron star occurs, the outcome is markedly depends on the binary period of the progenitor. For short, for very short, uh, like 10 to 10 centimeters to 11 centimeters, the binary, uh, the accretion onto the neutron star and then the neutron star will collapse to a black hole because it reaches the critical mass. But for longer binary period, as shown here, about 10 to 12 centimeter, the hypercritical accretion cannot give sufficient mass to the neutron star to bring the collapse. Uh, and the accretion rate here I wrote is uh, less than 0.01 solar mass per second for such a system. So the above is the initial uh, configuration and uh, below is a final configuration that there will be a new neutron star, newly born neutron star and a massive neutron star after accretion. So from the observation, such a system brings three kinds of signals. Uh, first is a shock wave breakout. So upper right, shock wave breakout. Oh, I cannot use my mouse. Uh, that's a shock wave outbreaks outermost layer. This signal in principle is weak and it can be hard to determine unless the source is very at a very low distance. The second is a major burst occurring during the creation of the supernova ejector onto the companion neutron star. This is defined as a pump emission. And the third is emission converted from the spin down energy of the newly formed neutron star, which lasts for a long time, contributing to the afterglow. And the uh, done by our colleagues. Well, on the, the solution. <laughs> 
Okay, so we can see the procedure anyway. But uh, the supernova explosion and the accretion leads to the a new binary system composed of a, a new neutron star at the center of the green region. It's at the green, a very little green, and a massive neutron star at the center of the red vertices. So now we go to observation, this JIB 180728A. And we keep the previous image in mind. Uh, this slide shows a counter rate light curve of the first 30 seconds. X coordinate is observer's time, and the Y coordinate is a received photons count, counts per second. We see there are two spikes a tiny precursor and a very high merger one. The precursor lasts less than three seconds from minus 1.5. 57 to 1.18 second. The explanation follows that theoretically, at a given time, supernova occurs, a strong shock wave is generated and emerges from the supernova ejector. A typical supernova shock wave carries about 10 to 51 arc energy, kinetic energy, which is partially converted into electromagnetic emission by an efficiency of about 10%. Therefore, the energy of 10 to 50 erg is in the first spike, theoretically. And from the observation, the first spike, the precursor, has an average luminosity of 3 times 10 to 49 second of 49 erg per second. And the integrated energy of its duration, about 3 seconds, gives 8 times 10 to 49 erg as estimated above from the theory. So the theory and the observation match well. Here, uh, this slide indicates the second spike. The second spike, which contains the majority of the energy, rises at 9 seconds, the peaks at 12 seconds, and the fades at uh, 23, 23 seconds. We have the corresponding explanation that from the theory, the distance of the binary system, uh, uh, the separation can be estimated by the delay time between the two spikes. So we see from the right up corner, it's about 10 seconds. Since the outer shell of the supernova ejector moves at the velocity, usually 0.1c, so we can estimate the binary separation is about 3 times 10 to 10 centimeter. Then following our numerical simulation, the total mass accreted by the companion neutron star gives about 10 to minus 2 solar mass in total. This uh, equals to the emission of energy 10 to 51 uh, considering the typical accretion efficiency of 10%. The majority of the mass is accreted in 10 seconds. That's the duration of the second spike. <laughs> Therefore, uh, the luminosity of 10 to 50 of a second, and uh, the duration uh, can be observed, uh, we presume. And uh, actually, indeed, from observation, the second spike arrives at uh, 10 seconds after the starting time of the first spike, lasts 14 seconds, and emits about uh, three times 10 to 51 erg in the energy band of 1 kV to 10 MeV. So again, the theory and observation match well. Now let's look into the spectra of the second spike, uh, the major one. The blue dotted curve represents a band function with a low energy index alpha minus 1.55 and a high energy index beta more, less than minus 3. The peak energy is 130 keV. And then we found an additional bad body represented by the orange dashed curve. The temperature is 7.3 keV. Uh, this 
uh, the thermal component is confident and it is well constrained by the color fitting. So the causes corner plot shows all the parameters from closed circles. So from the thermal component, we can directly derive the size and the expanding velocity of the system. Results are shown below that we will obtain the radius increasing from 1.4 10 to 10 centimeter to 4.3 10 to 10 centimeter, and the expansion velocity is 0.53 c, c velocity of light. This emission is explained by the adiabatic expansion of uh, the thermal outflow from accretion region. The, the really tight convective instability acts during the initial accretion phase, driving the material away from supernova or from the neutron star with a final velocity of the order of the speed of light. This material expands and cools, assuming the spherical symmetric expansion will have the theoretical function, also the temperature and the entropy, as shown here. And uh, when we put the value inside, exactly we got the temperature drops from 7 keV to 5 keV at an increasing radius of the order of 10 to 10 centimeter. So, theory and observation are surprisingly consistent. So we have introduced the early emission before the shocker will break out and pump emission. We have seen that our theoretical picture is consistent with observation. Now we enter the late time after glow, which is long but weak. So previously, uh, so our previous paper, we applied the synchrotron model of the mildly relativistic out outflow powder by the rotational energy of the new neutron star of GRB 13 over 23A. And here we apply using the same method to GRB 1807 28A. So this slide shows the luminosity light curve of these two GRBs. The late X-ray article of GRB 1807-28A follows a power law decay of the power law index is a minus 1.3. So the power law from 24 seconds. Actually, both are following minus 1.3 around. So we interpret it as this emission is a powder by a pulsar, the blue curve. So the fitting is a blue curve and the orange curve. So for having such a good fit, it requires the presence of a quadruple magnetic field in addition to the traditional dipole one. The mag magnet scenario, that popular model with only a strong dipole field, that the dipole field of more than 10 to 14 Gauss is not capable of fitting such a decay index. So we have the, but here with dipole it can. So we have the dipole luminosity and the quadruple luminosity equation shown here. And the fitting, gives that the initial period of 1807-28A, uh, 2.5 millisecond, the spin of the neutron star, which is slower than one millisecond of 13 of 27A. But both sources have normal from our fitting, very normal dipole magnetic field, 10 to 12 to 10 to 13 Gauss, but with a additional partial component, which is a 30 to 100 times stronger than the dipole one. This strong dipole field dominates the emission in early years, while the uh, strong particle field dominates in early years, while the dipole radiation starts to be prominent later when the spin decays. This is because the quadruple emission is more sensitive to the spin period. If we look at the formula, omega, which is the frequency, so the dipole is proportional to omega to four and the quadruple is omega six. So when the omega decreases, that's the quadruple emission decreases faster. Therefore, if we wait for some more years, so as of today, we have seen a lot of neutron star and we always see the dipole emission. So it, can, it is consistent with observation since this quadruple field is Dominating, dominating as an emission only in like uh, 0 .0, 0 0.5 percent of the total life, or 0 .0 total life of the neutron star. 
So with energy injection from neutron star spin down, we adopt a synchrotron model to fit the spectra at different times. So here shows an example of the fitting of JB 13 over 27A from the early time 600 seconds to almost uh, three months. And the, on a wide band of the emission from radio to till the GV band, the synchrotron model will fit the optical and X-ray data that you can see it in the middle. But for the radio part, it requires self-observation. And for the GV part, it requires an additional emission mechanism. So in the previous slides, we have inferred the binary separation from the pumped emission and the spin of the neutron star from afterglow data. In the following, we confer the, exist, the consistency of these findings by numerical simulations of these systems. So from an observational point of view, these two JBs are both long JBs. They are very different in energetic, that the 13 JB 13 of 7.8 is one of the most energetic JBs with isotropic energy more than 10 to 40, 54 arc, while the other is only 10 to 51. When some times less. And the JRB 13 has observed the most significant high energy photons, and it has the longest duration of GV emission, GV emission, and it has the highest energy of a photon ever observed in a GRB. And in contrast, GRB 18 or 728A has no GEV emission detected. But for the afterglow, and for the afterglow, the X-ray afterglow of the GRB 13 is more luminous, but they share the same power, as I said before, with index minus 1.3. And more than after 10 days of, of both systems, uh, uh, this in both GRB sites emerging the a typical type 1C supernova optical signal. And then the spectra of these two supernovae are almost identical. So these two GRB have the same kind of binary progenitor that are binary in our model, that are binary composed of a CO core and a companion neutron star. The difference is they have different binary separation. So if we consider that uh, the angular momentum conservation during gravitational collapse of the pre-supernova core that forms the new neutron star. It implies that the later should be fast rotating from the formula here. So here A is optical separation, A O R B. And omega O R B is orbital frequency, and omega mu, mu and A is a new neutron star spin frequency. So therefore, here simply simple equations connects the optical separation and the newly born neutron stars spin. And based on this information, we seek two systems in our simulations presented in Bichella in et al. 2019 with the following properties that they have. This system should have similar supernova expulsion energy, similar free supernova core, and the initial companion mass that will different the optical period to about 2.5 times difference. Then we examine the results of the simulations presented in that paper uh, for the uh, pre supernova core of 25 solar masses, their age may sequence progenitor, and as the initial mass of the neutron star companion, companion of two solar mass. Indeed, we found two models. One with orbital period about five minutes, and the other with period 12 minutes. And in the first model, the neutron, the neutron star companion reached the critical mass and collapsed to a black hole. This model produced GRB similar to 13 over 27A. And in the second model, the neutron star companion does not reach a critical mass. And this system produced those GRB similar to 18 or 728A. And as the system leading to collapse remains bound after the 
explosion while the one leading to GRB 18.07.28a is disrupted. So using the formula in this previous slides, <coughs> we can have the spin, we compute again the spin period is one millisecond and 2.5 milliseconds respectively, exactly the same value as inferred from the article from our observation. Therefore, the simulation confers observation in our modeling picture. But the confirmation of the supernova is, requires the emergence of the optical signal, which rises at about two weeks after supernova explosion because it uh, has the half-life of elements and the diffusion, diffusion duration. And we made two predictions. We made, uh, here I will show one, that this 18 of 7, 8, 8. We made the prediction always just after the uh, gamma ray burst, since our model indicates the existence of the supernova. And the model requires the supernova. And indeed, uh, the supernova was confirmed later. So it's above, uh, HGCN is our prediction. The below one is a confirmation. When you and here, uh, I, okay, I, I'm finishing. And uh, this is the spectra of the supernova. So this confers the, the existence of supernova. Okay, I think I finished. Okay. Okay. Hello, hello, I have done. Thanks for you. Huh? If you, you still have a, a couple of minutes, I mean, you, you want to leave it five minutes, so if you, have, if you want to uh, some other minutes. Uh, uh, I think it's okay, I think it's okay. If some question I answer, because there are a lot of things I don't have time to go over. Okay. okay. Mm. Uh, there are more questions in the chat. So is there someone who uh, wants to make questions? Even my voice. Okay, uh, so. If not, let's thank uh, one you for the presentation. Uh, oh, um, uh, Yes, yeah. yes, yes, we can hear very well. Uh, Wang Yu, can you tell us something about the intelligence uh, method? You have a few minutes. Okay. So the intelligence like method is as uh, a standard model of the HGN. HGN thinks that uh, different uh, HNs uh, they have the they are the same, but they are viewed by different angles. Uh, by different angles. And here I can see the sixth galaxies, but the sixth galaxy type one and type two, type one, type two, they are interpreted by viewing different viewing angles. One is on the axis, one is one is on uh, with a big angle. So and the emission of this object uh, that's three components that is a uh, the jet, first from the jet, or from the HM, the black hole and the surrounding material. And the third is from the host galaxy. So I want to judge, uh, so if this, if we observe, if the same model is correct, then, Oh, and then, oh, I should say the broad line region, narrow line region. So these are the different. These are the difference of the two classes of the sifter galaxy. So, if the standard model is correct, then uh, we all it likes assuming that the galaxies are the same, but the each galaxies are the same. So if I cover the borderline, if I cover this H alpha H beta, all these this lines used to distinguish the different types of the sifter galaxies, 
the computer should not be able to distinguish the these two classes anymore. Okay, but in reality, in reality, even if I don't give the information of the emission lines, even all the emission lines, all obvious emission lines, the computer is still able to distinguish these two classes of sift galaxies. This gives shows that uh, perhaps the other emission, like the host galaxies of the computer, the AI is very strong. It looks at all the spectrum, not like human being, only the, those prominent lines. So this may indicate that the host galaxies could be different. Okay, so this is just like the conclusion. But this is just a possibility. That the host galaxies of the different agents could be different. But it has a lot of technical things. I think it's okay, Professor. If someone is interested, he can contact me and then we can discuss. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay. Beautiful talks. Hmm. Thanks, Wang Yun. Okay. okay. So we can check if the next speaker is online. Yai, Yang Li, are you there? Did you succeed in reconnecting? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I'm giving you the presenter status okay try to share your screen okay okay can you uh, open your webcam too mm -hmm. So I'm trying to enlarge my screen. Uh, uh, okay. What is that? Is uh, our mind? What is PDF? Usually F five. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. We see the okay. Can you open the webcam so you can see your uh, Because the. Let us slow in the so okay. I think so it's okay. So, okay. You, can, you can start and I warn you at five minutes before then. Okay. 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 Please. Well, can I start? Start? Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Liani. Uh, it's my great to um, give this talk here. Uh, my talk today focuses on two uh, recent recent papers in our group. Uh, the title of my presentation is "Safe Zone 19 and Apollo in the Time Resolution Spectra of the 4 GRBs. My main collaborator, uh, including Professor Professor Rufini and Professor Liu, the Doctor Mati, and uh, Doctor Wang Yu and uh, Professor Sersen. Um, before I'm going to my talk, uh, let me first introduce several import, important uh, satellites using in the gamma ray burst observations. The first is the NASA SWIFT satellite, which was launched since 2004, and uh, it is the first uh, multi-wave lens observatory, observatory de dedicated to studying of the gamma ray burst science. SWIFT has three scientific uh, instrument. First is the Bose Alert uh, Telescope, which we call which we call BAT, BAT, focus on to check and uh, detect gamma ray bursts from emission. And the other two are the X Telescope and the uh, Optical Telescope, uh, focus on the optical emission observ observations. The other one is the 
Uh, late, the other one is uh, very important satellite is uh, last Fumi Gamma Ray Space Telescope was launched in 2008 and started work to, and it carried two main scientific uh, instrument. Um, first is the Gamma Ray Burst Morant, uh, which we call GBM, and uh, the other one is the Large Area Telescope, which we call LIGHT. GBM folks detect uh, the emission in the from the KEV to MEV MEV uh, energy band, and the light folks detect the high energy emission, usually in GEV emission. The observed energy range in FEMI and therefore is much wider than SWIFT. Uh, from detect can be detected from the eight KEV to more than uh, around the uh, 300 GeV. Um, this is the magic telescope. This telescope usually dedicated to the observation in very high emission. For example, to observe the gamma ray emission source in the very high energy range um, can be reached to 13, 13 GeV to the 100 TeV. The first uh, GRB was Type of emission was detected by magic last year. So also I want to introduce some basic observations in gamma ray burst before introduction of our works. The spectral component of the brom emission of gamma ray burst mainly consists of two possible physical origins. One is the thermal component, component um, originate from the photosphere emission when the optic death goes to unit. The other is the line thermal component originated from the synchrotron emission when the system is in the optical regions. This figure show a uh, typical observed observe the spectral characteristic in gamma ray burst, in which the two different emission components can be simultaneously observed. So compared, compared with the line thermal synchrotron spectrum, the thermal black body emission has a more narrow spectrum. The line thermal synchrotron emission can be well described by a smooth break spectrum, namely the band function. The band model has four model parameters, the polarization, including the polarization, the low energy spectral index alpha and the, the high energy spectral index beta and the peak energy. In some cases, when beta index is not a constraint, the band model usually can be repressed by a cut polar models. And the black body thermal emission can be modif modified by, uh, by the Planck spectral. This, um, the Planck function only has two parameters. One is the normalization and another is the temperature. So the parameter is is uh, is estimation. We use the Benson inference plus um, plus Markovian monocolor method fitting because the fitting Benson statistic model by using Markovian monocolor method has become a standard tool for the parameter estimation in astronomy in recent years. All this data analysis is carried out by using a, a poor Python package, namely the 3ML package. So let me now introduce uh, the professional roof, reference model in periphery. This model can be uh, simply described by this cartoon picture. Uh, I will focus on what the observations characteristic predict by this model. In Professor reference model, there are three major stages to describe the system evolutions and the corresponding uh, pro pro produce different observed spectral and uh, light curves. The first one is the superior rise process, which is produced by the CO core explosion. This emission corresponds to a thermal component, Planck function spectrum. It will appear 
in early time. The second process is the ultra-characteristic prom emission, which we call UPE phase, with, which is uh, produced by the black hole in a strong mag magnetic field. Walker um, polarization produces high density positron electron pairs. So a black body thermal component should be also detected in this process. And the last process is the cavity located on the back of the black hole. And this process can be described by a frictionless line thermal synchrotron component. And the, the spectral can be well fitting by an empirical bundle or color polar functions. So in short, compared to transition models, there are at least two advantages in, in this model. First, the professor reference model is based on a binary star system, which is much, much better than a transition mod, model, like FOB model, because we know that the binary star system are more common observed in the universe. Second, compared to transition models, another advantage in professor reference model is that it could Naturally, explain why a GRB associated with a supernova. So I will focus on the data analysis in my next talk to uh, to explain how the observation of our fossils are consistent with these models. So, <clears throat> so the first is uh, we analyze the uh, uh, GRB lighting of one fourteen C. This was the was checked by Fermi GBM on 14 January in uh, last year. The bolster is very interesting and, and bright with the richest multi wavelength observations, including the Fermi, Swift, and the many ground based optical telescope, which, co which cover from KeV, MeV, and the GEV, GeV emissions. More interesting, this bolster is the first time detected by. TUV emission by the magical. So we have identified in it in three different episodes. The, the first episode is the precursor, which in, including the supra rise and the, the creation of the new neutron star, the hypercritical critical accretion of the super supra inject onto the neutron binary compound ex, ex, exceeding the neutrino critical mass at uh, the 1.9 seconds in the rest of frame. The episode two starting at the um, uh, 1.9 uh, second, including three major events. The for formation of the, the formation of the black hole, the onset of the gel emission and the onset of the neutron UPE phase, uh, which extended all the way up to uh, 3.99 uh, second in the rest of frame. And the last uh, episode three, which occurs at uh, the time for uh, 3.99, light light, we raise the process of uh, percent of a uh, cavity carried out in the supernova inject by the black hole formation. So we then perform the detailed time resolution spectral analysis by using the Fermi GBM data of this source. We found on the entire UPE phase with uh, the corresponding determination of the spectral best fitting by a cut polo and a, a black body models. So we perform the uh, spectral analysis in five uh, su successful time inter interventions in in creationing short time being. This is the this is the first uh, this is the first um, iterations. Then we repeat the first iteration for other four iterations, but divided the time interval into four into two, four, eight, six equal parts re respectively. We find a similarity in the spectral in each stage of the iteration, revealing clear a similar structure. So we summarize all our, our results in table two. Uh, 
So the first uh, column is the time interval for Intel, uh, Intel editions in the observed frame. Since this first uh, has a red, red shift measurement, we also correct time interval in the rest of frame. And show in the second core. From the third to five columns, we list the best fitting parameters. Uh, this parameter including the low energy index, peak energy, and the temperature from uh, um, temperature from um, band plus black body model fittings. The sixth core is the posterior IIC and BAC statistical values. This way we can use it to in, in indicate how well our data fit in the models. Then from seven and eight colors are the black body and the total flux. Uh, the, the light uh, color is the ratio between the black, uh, um, black body flux and the total flux. The last color is the astrobic arranging for each individual spectrals. And we brought the, um, uh, the temperature as a function of time. We found a power law. Uh, we found that the, um, the temperature is showing a power law decay with the index uh, with the decay index minus 2.25. So this the similar result we also found in the luminosity. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the gamma ray luminosity confirmed the similar similar uh, power law decay with the uh, the index is minus minus one point twenty, uh, which we find uh, this similar to which we to the result which we find uh, as well in the gel luminosity. So because the observation in nineteen one fourteen C explained by Professor Rufinus Mog is very success successful, we then further search for other sources and find three more similar cases. <clears throat> So this picture shows the light curve under the corresponding gel emission evolution for other uh, three, three, three uh, sources. We also identify all the three processes in this new series as we have found it in Latin 14 c So this, uh, <clears throat> this figure shows the superlarized component for our source. Uh, all can be well fit in by uh, uh, color power or plus black body models, or one case can be fit in by well by polar plus black body models. So we also compile the properties of the superlar rays for all fossils and, for, and find they pre present very similar result. A black body component found in early time for each case. He said, the duration energy and the black body temperature of the of the solar rays are also very similar. So we also identified the UPE phase. In other words, this is the sum data analysis for GRB uh, lighting of 146, but apply to another source, uh, GRB 60.0625b. So in the UPE regions, we found a clean black body component in the spectral analysis. The table summarizes the result of the time resolution spectral analysis and also five successful time intuition. This is the summary result of uh, also for other sources like 16 or 5 or like A. So this uh, figure show the cavity for all, all the all four sources. So the cavity, the spectral well fitting uh, of the cavity show your frictionless cut polar component. So we then conclude that the observation for these four sources are consistent with the professor reference model. So this is uh, the afterglow. Uh, the light curve of the afterglow for our four source also show you the beautiful um, power law decay. So also uh, the detail 
uh, in our analysis above, we draw the four con uh, conclusions. The thanks, uh, my speaking stop, finish. Thanks. Thanks. Is there any comment question? I don't okay, see okay. anything in chat, so is anyone uh, want to intervene to make a comment or a question? Uh, I would like to make a comment coming from this morning presentation uh, on uh, 09-0429B by Lorenzo Marti. It will be very important to check if um, the afterglow of this uh, 090429B at Z9.2 uh, could fulfill uh, the, the power law, average power law for the other GRB that we have analyzed. This would be a very important check both to verify the value of the redshift so high, but uh, to strengthen the evidence that process of supernova have occurred already at Z9.2 to generate a BDHN. I, I, I hope very much that with your splendid expertise, Liang Li, you can proceed as soon as possible to this exciting check, and we will uh, refer to Professor Amati. Okay. Okay. Other comments or questions? So if not, let's thank Yingli again. Okay. And uh, we can move to the next speaker. Okay. Yes, yeah. Are you online, Irina? <clears throat> uh, I would like to tell that sure. uh, to the collective everybody that since the uh, supernova 1987A, I uh, hope you everybody recollect a lot of years spent and uh, these problems are still of uh, very great interest. Thank you for uh, okay. Thanks for the comment. For this contribution. Thank you again. Uh, I I recollect in 1987 a very very a very uh, tremendous uh, uh, discussions uh, happened. In, at, at the Sternberg Institute in Moscow, where Zildovich was present there. This, this was uh, just after February of 1987. Yes. A lot of uh, discussions. Sunyayev was uh, there also, and many other people from, from Blinnikov, uh, Shakura, uh, mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, thanks for the comment and let's keep the uh, presenter role to Irina. Irina, can you share your screen? Yes, I try to share my screen. <clears throat> Okay. Let's see my presentation. So, okay. okay. <coughs> so, you can start, and uh, I'll warn yes, you five uh, minutes before the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, please, Rita. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, J <coughs> hmm. uh, high energy emission. I'm sorry, but my presentation is not listed. And uh, can I show it without full screen demonstration? 
Sure. No problem. Unfortunately, it is not listed. I don't know why. So do you see the next slide? Yes, yes, we see the, the slide. First we saw the slide. Just a moment. <clears throat> so, gamma ray burst of observed since 1967, and now several thousand of events were listed in more than 20 catalogs as results of more than 40 satellites and ground experiments. Firstly, evidence of uh, TV and sub-TV emission were registered during JRB 970417A uh, on data of Milagrita. Several photons with energies more than 600 GV were detected. So, <clears throat> but high energy JRB emission were also registered by satellite experiment on board Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. <clears throat> it is very interesting that uh, in some JRB spectra, the new spectral component, non-correspondent band model, was found in the energy band up to 200 MeV. Previously, only <clears throat> sorry. Previously, only band, uh, previously mostly JRB spectra described only by band model. So, and then it is possible to introduce two spectral break in spectrum of JRB. Do you see my mouse or not? Yes, we see. I'm sorry, do you see? Yes, okay. Uh, first break correspond to um, boundaries between first and second band component located somewhere, and second correspond to non-band <clears throat> ash energy component of JRB. So, and for several GRB, after glow in high energy, were detected too. For example, for GRB 940217, it was detected photons with, photon with energy 18 GV. Uh, after 1.5 hour after start of birds. It was first uh, high energy after glow. Yes. So, uh, short summary for uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory data about GRBs. Uh, they detect uh, high energy only for 15 bursts and uh, mostly no prompt emission in energy band more than 200 MeV. Only burst which uh, registered by Milagrita. And some GRB uh, has high energy extended emission. Some GRBs has new additional spectral component, which don't correspond band model. And <clears throat> Most uh, uh, and the uh, widest energy range of gamma emission registration, both prompt and extended, was 10 kV, approximately 20 GV. So, next step of 
uh, observation of high energy emission of GRB was a VSF uh, experiment on board Russian Corona SF satellite. Uh, start in 2001 and end in 2005 years. Uh, several bursts were registered in energy band up to approximate, approximate, approximately 150 MeV. So, and all characteristics which was registered during the GRO experiment were confirmed. So, next step start in 2007 with experiment Angela and 2008 with experiment Fermi. And uh, it, it was very interesting that third spectral bread should be introduced in low energy band, approximately in tens of TV. And then we have three spectral breaks in GRB spectra, first, second, and third. Also, several tens of GRB has high energy afterglow, which lasting several thousands of seconds after end of burst T sub 90. So, and during an experiment Agile, where uh, several high energy precursors were registered on pre preliminary results. For example, for GRB 080514B in energy band up, um, up to 30 GV. So <clears throat> now approximately 170 GRB is detected by Fermilat and 41 detected by Agile. Mostly all properties correspond characteristic observed during CGRO and AVSF database analysis, but additional uh, component in GRB spectra observed some often than in previous experiment. New spectral break was introduced in low energy band, but uh, one question of course about extension of a high energy component to low energy region down to tens of TV. Because of when we try to analyze such spectrum, we can see this is not band component in high energy, range, but this is component and low energy range. And you can see that spectral index are similar. And for this burst, spectral indexes are similar too. <clears throat> so, and both short and long GRB has extended emission on data of Fermilat and Angela. But <clears throat> GRB sources origin nature is cosmological. Uh, in this case, correction to cosmological dilation in GRB's duration distribution should be considered because of <clears throat> Real-time properties should be investigated only taking into account its redshift. These graphs show distribution of T sub zero, which measured on experiment, and T sub zero corrected to redshift. And you can see that uh, if you have burst with duration 10 seconds, which classified as long GRB, it can move to 
area approximately two second and then will be questions about its classification. So, <clears throat> this picture show large RB distribution on birth duration and maximum energy of registered photons. Red circles show burst from which redshift is measured and <clears throat> red triangles shows result of redshift correction. So, and you can see that mostly bursts after redshift correction shifted in the regions approximately from three to 30 second in duration. <clears throat> so if we analyze distribution of duration of high energy episode and prompt emission, so it is possible just a moment. It is possible to separate two subclasses of mostly long GRB for which these episodes are smaller. High energy episode is smaller than low energy duration, and for second, it is more longer than low energy duration. So, but this parameter <clears throat> requires cosmological correction too. And it is possible to introduce new value RT as ratio of maximum energy photon area time to birth duration in low energy band. So, and this value will not require cosmological correction. And uh, using this value, burst approximately divided by two classes. And examples of such burst shown on following slides. First burst for which arrival time for gamma quantum with maximum energy was later than 10 sub zero. For this burst, it inside of T sub 90 interval. So, and <clears throat> for this burst, high energy <clears throat> emission duration interval is bigger than T sub 92. And gamma quantum with maximum energy arrived after the T sub 90 again. So <clears throat> using this parameter, we can separate at least two groups of long GRB but it is possible to separate third type. So first type will be when high energy emission duration interval smaller than 10 sub 90. Second group will be for high energy emission duration interval more longer than 10 sub 90, but gamma quantum with maximum energy during these events was uh, registered for type A within T sub 90 interval and for type B after then T sub 90 interval. Um, 
if we consider very high energy emission, mostly it registered later than T sub 90 and several GRB can be interpreted as afterglow, as burst with high energy afterglow. So, <clears throat> but no sufficient correlation between maximum energy and redshift during prompt emission observed. Uh, unfortunately, now only five GRB with sub-definition sub were detected. First, I show you on the second slide. It was the data of Milagrita. Uh, but other which were registered during Fermi satellite operation has characteristic corresponding to B type, three GRB, three long GRB. and to one type on preliminary results. Only for GRB 1908-29A was registered prompt emission in sub-TEF energy band by HES. So, then conclusions. Several thousands of GRB were observed in various experiments, and high energy photons were detected approximately during several tens of events. So, um, several events from this subsample were registered in sub TF area. And now high energy gamma emission was observed during short and long bursts. Uh, unfortunately, mostly for long bursts. Uh, now we know only one short burst with sub TF energy and three bursts with energy several GV. So, GRB mostly located at cosmological distances, and then cosmological correction should be used in duration and, <clears throat> in duration and other time properties investigation. Uh, here we introduce new value RT, which is ratio between maximum energy photon arrival time to burst duration in low energy band. And such parameter not required cosmological correction. But when we analyze such this parameter, it is possible to separate two GRB groups. For 25% of events, high, highest energy gamma detected within T sub 90 interval, but for other 75% of bursts, it registered more than 10 seconds later than one. And it is possible using these parameters to separate three types of GRB. During first subgroup of events, high energy emission interval smaller than burst duration T sub 19. Second subtype of events characterized more longer periods of high energy emission than duration in low energy interval T sub 19. And it is possible to separate two subtype in this type of events. Firstly, subtype A, gamma quantum with maximum energy arrived within T sub 90 interval. And B, 
such photon was registered later than T sub 19. Therefore, results of preliminary analysis allow to conclude GRB's population in homogeneity because of uh, such variations of properties should cause uh, should should caused by uh, different emission mechanisms seems to me. So <clears throat> sorry, thank you for attention. Have you any questions? Thank you, Irina. Are there any questions or comments? Not in the chat, but maybe someone wants to intervene and give a question by voice. The comment? Uh, is uh, the master. Oh, I'm afraid the line from the beginning. So what is problem? Lost connection again. Because someone was making a question, but then suddenly the voice stopped, so probably the connection called his connection called. But maybe he sent me email and I answer him by post. Okay. Yeah, because it's not recovering, so okay. Because so if not, we have not sufficient <laughs> time for it. <laughs> let's thank Irene again, and uh, let's see if the next speaker is online. Cosimo Bambi, are you online? Yes, I'm online. Okay, perfect. So I can uh, on your. Screen sharing. Let's try to. Do you see my screen? screen if be able to see Not yet. Oh, see, we see. Perfect. We see it very well. If you want, you can turn on the webcam as well. Ah, right. Uh... Okay, do you see me? Absolutely, yes, perfect. Okay. Okay. Shall I start? So, yeah, we can start. Please. I so, will uh, wait five minutes before uh, for ending. Okay, so uh, the title of my talk is uh, Testing Generativity with Black Holes uh, Using X-ray ob Observation. And uh, the idea is uh, indeed to test uh, generativity by studying uh, the radiation emitted from the very inner part of the accretion disk. This is uh, the structure of the presentation, but actually I will skip many slides because I have only 25 minutes and I will try to focus on the uh, key point. So about the motivation, uh, generativity. General relativity was proposed at the end of uh, 1915, but uh, uh, the first uh, experimental test, I mean, systematically test of generativity starts much later because uh, generativity is difficult to test. So systematic tests started in the 60s and even 70s with uh, uh, experiment in the solar system and observation of binary pulsars. And uh, in the past, uh, say, uh, 50, 60 years, uh, generativity has been extensively tested in the so-called weak field regime. 
which means uh, uh, this system can be described as a Newtonian system plus uh, some small correction. And uh, we want to uh, check whether these corrections are consistent with the prediction of generativity. Uh, recently, the interest has uh, shifted to uh, test other environment. In the sense, I mean, they st people still uh, continue testing generativity in the weak field reg regime, but there are also uh, other regime. In particular, in the past uh, 20 years, uh, there have been a lot of effort uh, to test uh, generativity on large scale with uh, a cosmological test, in part, but not only, uh, motivated by the problem of dark matter and dark energy. And even more recently, uh, there are efforts to test generativity in the strong field regime with uh, black hole and neutron star. And, uh, here, uh, I am interested in a uh, test uh, with black holes. So this is a slide uh, to remind the uh, uh, basic properties of uh, black holes in generativity. Uh, there is a family of theorems. Uh, they are, are called uh, no hair theorems, in which event uh, we see that uh, in generativity under some uh, reasonable condition, uh, black holes are uh, quite simple objects in the sense they are completely described by a few parameters, the mass, the spin, and the electric charge. Uh, even if, I mean, these are macroscopic objects, uh, they have just a few features. Uh, in uh, astrophysics, uh, typically the electric charge is negligible, negligible, so we have only the mass and the spin, and uh, the solution is called the Kerr solution. So if you know the mass and the spin, we know everything about the space-time geometry, and in principle, you can predict how particles, uh, mass, massive particle and massless particle move uh, in the gravitational field around the black hole, which is eventually what we want to test. Uh, a priori, we can question whether uh, the ideal care solution can describe well uh, the space time around an astrophysical black hole. Uh, we can quantify this deviation. Of course, there are deviations. Uh, but in the end, these are extremely small and completely negligible. So actually, they are very, uh, it is very difficult to uh, measure these uh, deviations. So for example, here I sketch some uh, possibility like uh, the presence of an accretion disk uh, nearby stars. But actually, we want to test the strong gravity region near the black hole. So the accretion disk is many order of magnitude smaller than the black hole, even if it is large. Uh, the mass is, is very small. Even the uh, nearby star in the end is far from the black hole. The electric charge, I mean, there may be a non-vanishing electric charge, but in any case, it is completely negligible. We can estimate these uh, uh, parameters, but I mean, uh, they are uh, irrelevant for our test because we don't have uh, so good precision even to measure the possibility of the existence of a Christian disk or electric charge. Uh, however, there are uh, extensions of generativity that predict deviation from uh, the Kerr metric. Here I listed just uh, some example. I mean, macroscopic quantum gravity effect, and there are some uh, people uh, suggesting possible deviation from generativity with some specific scenarios. Uh, modified theory of gravity, in the sense the classical theory is not generativity, but some other theory, or the presence of exotic matter. Uh, and in this case, there are some kind of uh, iry black hole that may have deviation from general, from the Kerr uh, solution. Uh, from the astrophysical point of view, uh, we know uh, two, three classes of uh, uh, black hole. Uh, stellar mass black hole, they are the natural product of the collapse of heavy stars after they exhausted the neutral fuel. Uh, Supermass black hole, they are at the center of every normal galaxy. We don't completely understand uh, the nature of this object in the sense how really they form and grow, but I mean, they are strong. There are evidence uh, these objects are there. And then there are also some uh, a little bit more controversial evidence uh, on the existence of intermediate mass black hole with the mass uh, filling the gap between the stellar mass and the supermassive one. This is uh, an artist picture of uh, a stellar mass black hole. Actually, it should be seen sex one. So you have a companion star, you have a black hole. The black hole strips some material from the companion star. You have a formation of accretion disk. The gas uh, lose energy and angular momentum, so uh, fall onto the gravitational potential of the black hole. And what we want to study in the end is the uh, radiation emitted from a very inner part of the accretion disk where uh, uh, gravity is strong. 
here they are uh, this is a picture just to show uh, the known uh, stellar mass black hole with the dynamical measurement of the mass but I don't have the time to uh, uh, to discuss uh, and today I mean the past say uh, five years uh, we can also uh, observe a gravitational wave from uh, stellar mass black hole produced by stellar mass black hole uh, in the case of, uh, uh, well, let me uh, say a key point about uh, uh, this uh, stellar mass black hole. So uh, we have uh, evidence that there are these uh, objects, they are compact and uh, they are heavy, heavier than uh, the maximum mass for a neutron star. So for this reason, uh, we think uh, uh, they are black holes. In the case of uh, uh, stellar supermassive black hole in galactic nuclei, we have some uh, similar uh, evidence in the sense, for example, this is uh, um, these are the data of Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. We can uh, study the orbital motion of, of individual star. You can fit the data, and at the end, you can uh, conclude that uh, at the center there is a large amount of mass in a small volume. And so, you, for this reason, you conclude that, uh, it should be a black hole. This is a well-known picture, which is uh, uh, the dark image of a, a supermassive black hole at the center of galaxy M87. And uh, uh, it was released just uh, last year. And this is what you would expect for a black hole. And this is indeed uh, what uh, you see. So in the end, uh, there is uh, robust evidence for the existence of compact objects uh, in uh, the galaxy and in the universe. And they can be naturally interpreted as the black hole predicted by general activity. Uh, here, the idea is uh, to see if we can test uh, the Kerr solution in the sense of the prediction of general activity. Uh, I mean, maybe these are black holes from other theory of gravity, or I mean, there are some uh, exotic, there is some exotic matter, and there, are, there may be deviation from the Kerr solution. So, basically, we want to test uh, here uh, the Kerr metric uh, of around uh, the, this black hole. So, how can we test? Uh, this black hole, uh, there are two natural approaches because we have to probe today, electromagnetic test and gravitational wave test. Actually, uh, these, uh, two, uh, uh, these two techniques uh, can, are sensitive to different physics because uh, they can test uh, different sectors. In particular, electromagnetic tests are sensitive to the interaction between the matter and the gravity sector. In particular, you can study the motion of a massive and massless particle, and you can study uh, atomic and nuclear physics near black hole. I mean, just something like a I mean, uh, test of the uh, weak equivalence principle. In the case of gravitational wave tests, they are sensitive to the, gravitation, to the propagation and the generation of gravitational waves. So you can directly test uh, uh, the Einstein equation. Uh, here we are interested in uh, electromagnetic tests and even with, uh, within electromagnetic test, uh, you can follow two approach, which are normally called uh, top-down and bottom-up. Uh, top-down is the most uh, natural way. Uh, you want to test the general activity against uh, some other theory of gravity. So you want to test the Kerr solution against uh, some other uh, black hole solution in other theory of gravity. Uh, there are two uh, problems, difficulties. Uh, first, uh, you have a large number of uh, theory of gravity, so you should repeat this test uh, for uh, every uh, theory. And uh, the second and even uh, more important uh, issue is that uh, usually you don't know uh, the rotating black hole solution in uh, alternative of gravity. And this is just a technical uh, problem. I mean, technical problem to solve uh, the corresponding field equation, which uh, was true even for general activity. So the, the Svarshi solution describing a uh, non-rotating black hole uh, was uh, uh, discovered uh, immediately after uh, the advent of general activity by Svarshild in uh, 1916. And over the end, it took more than uh, 40 years to find uh, the rotating solution, which is the Kerr solution. So it is just a technical difficulty, but uh, in the end, uh, often we don't have uh, the rotating black hole solution in alternative gravity. So in the past uh, few years, uh, people have all often preferred this uh, bottom-up approach in which uh, you consider a parametric black hole space-time, in which you have some uh, uh, phenological deviation from a Kerr metric quantified by some, this deformation parameter, and you want to uh, measure these deformation parameters. Uh, this uh, bottom-up approach uh, reminds uh, the PPM formalism. 
which was uh, uh, which has been extensively uh, used to uh, test uh, for testing the solar system. So in the case of the solar system, you want to test uh, the Svarshield solution in the weak field regime. You consider the most general line element, which is uh, uh, static and spherical symmetric. You quantify, so you consider an expansion m over r. You quantify your ignorance with this parameter, beta and gamma. You know that in generativity, you have only the virtual solution and beta and gamma are one. You want to uh, measure with observation beta and gamma. And uh, today, we have this uh, limit. So beta and gamma are one at the level of 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5. So you want to do something similar with the Kerr metric. You have uh, the Kerr solution. You consider some extension with some uh, deformation parameter. And you want to measure this deformation parameter. And this is also the approach uh, I will show you. I mean, I follow in the past few years and I will show you in this presentation. So about, uh, more specifically about the method, uh, I will talk about the two methods, X-ray reflection spectroscopy, which is the study of a reflection spectrum of the accretion disk, and continuum fitting method, which is the analysis of the thermal spectrum of the accretion disk. Uh, these two techniques uh, were developed, uh, uh, say, uh, 20 years ago, more or less. Uh, by astronomers to uh, measure the black hole spin. So the original idea of this technique was to measure uh, the spin from the thermal spectrum of the disk or from the reflection spectrum. But they can be naturally extended to test uh, generativity. This is uh, a cartoon of the astrophysical system. So we have a black hole, we have an accretion disk. Uh, the uh, accretion disk is in, every point of accretion disk is in local thermal equilibrium. And every point has a black body like spectrum. And when you integrate over the whole disk, you have a multi temperature black body spectrum. So, this uh, shows by the red arrows this uh, thermal component. Then there is a corona, which is uh, some hot plasma near the black hole, but its, its uh, exact geometry morphology is not uh, well understood and it may change. Basically, the corona is just some hot gas near the black hole. A uh, thermal photon from the accretion disk can inverse Compton scatter of free electron in the corona. And the result is uh, the power law component uh, shown by these uh, uh, blue arrows. Uh, in part, uh, we can observe this power law component. And so we know that the corona is there. And uh, a part of, a, of this Comptonized uh, uh, photon can illuminate the disk. Here we have atomic physics processes. And the result is the reflection component. So the X-ray reflection spectroscopy refer to the study of the reflection component, and the continuum fitting method refer to the study of the thermal component. The power law component, as you can imagine, is not very informative uh, because it is just a power law, actually, power law with exponential cutoff, and uh, can have some information about the corona, but not about uh, uh, the geometry of the space time. Here I have a few slides uh, about uh, I mean, this uh, technique. Uh, here you have uh, uh, on the left panel uh, the incident radiation, which is a power law, and then the reflection component, which is uh, well, which is characterized by many emission lines, in particular uh, the iron K alpha line around uh, 6.4 keV. And this is in the rest frame of a gas, but then it is distorted due to uh, the motion of a gas in the disk and uh, the space time metric. So this is the basic idea. So we assume to know atomic physics because this is the same as the one in the laboratory. So we can predict the reflection spectrum at the emission point. This is an assumption, of course, because I mean there are theoretical uh, theories in which this is not true. Uh, then you have uh, observation. You can measure the uh, reflection spectrum of the cold far from the source. And then the connection between uh, two is this two ingredient is uh, the astrophysical model, in the sense uh, the model for the accretion disk and the corona, and the space-time metric. So if you have a correct astrophysical model, you can think of uh, learning something about the space-time metric. Uh, in the case of a continuum fitting method, we have uh, something similar. You have uh, an astrophysical model, which is the normally the novikov torn model. And uh, well, there are several parameters. I mean, the, the, the final result depends also on the space-time metric. And so for this reason, in, if you assume care, you can measure the black hole spin. And uh, if you don't assume care, you have some extra parameter, and these extra parameters somehow can affect uh, the final result. 
And uh, this is uh, the metric I uh, usually used. Uh, this is the Janssen metric, which is the parametric recall space time. I mean, there are many uh, choices in literature, and this is just uh, one of the choices. And there is no specific reason, but uh, uh, this uh, consideration can be also, I mean, uh, I can use uh, another metric and uh, there are no uh, difference. And the key point is that this is, uh, there are, there are an infinite number of deformation parameters. When the deformation parameters are zero, you recover care. So you want to, to leave this deformation parameter free and then uh, see if observation can uh, constrain this deformation parameter. So about the model, uh, we have these two models. Uh, the names are Rx and K and NKBB. Rx and K is for uh, fitting the X-ray uh, reflection spectrum, and NKBB is uh, to fit uh, the thermal spectrum of the accretion disk. The name uh, mine has no particular meaning. This is just uh, due to the, uh, the name of uh, previous model. These are basically extension to non metric of uh, previous model. Uh, I don't have the time to discuss uh, uh, Rx and K and KBB. I can only say that uh, in the case of Rx and K, uh, we have a public version, which can be downloaded from, from this uh, uh, website, where the, here, this is the uh, QR code. And well, there are several flavors, and this is just an example of uh, reflection spectrum calculated, where here alpha 1,3 is one of the deformation parameters of the Janssen metric. You, I mean, you change the value of alpha 1,3, uh, you change uh, your uh, spectrum. So modulo some degeneracy with other parameters, you can uh, imagine that uh, you can fit your data and then you can uh, get the constraint on alpha 1,3. This is the same for alpha 2,2. Two. You can imagine uh, some deformation parameters are easier to uh, measure, some deformation parameters are difficult, or maybe they have no effect on your spectrum. Typically, if you uh, alter GTT, uh, GT5, or G55, this uh, uh, metric coefficient, uh, you have larger deviation because you affect uh, uh, the, the, uh, the structure of the accretion disk. If you alter uh, GRR or G theta theta, typically you affect only the motion of the photons, and the effect is uh, uh, very weak. And this is the same for uh, the thermal spectrum of the disk, even in this case. I mean, uh, the thermal spectrum is calculated uh, assuming a certain background. Uh, you have this uh, alpha 1,3, uh, this deformation parameter. You, have, you change the value of alpha 1,3, uh, you have uh, some uh, different uh, uh, result. So this is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this is to, to understand uh, why we can uh, measure the deformation parameters. So the result, uh, in the past uh, few years, uh, we uh, have uh, analyzed several sources uh, with uh, Rexil and K. And this is uh, a list of sources where in magenta, we have supermassive black hole and in blue, uh, stellar mass black holes. Uh, but basically the, the key point is to find uh, good data and uh, a good source, a good source in the sense that with the good properties uh, in which uh, you limit uh, the systematic uncertainty of your model. Here I have, uh, uh, I can show you a specific case, MCG63015, which is a supermassive black hole, is characterized by very strong uh, iron line, which is uh, good for this kind of test. And there are also good observation with uh, a simultaneous observation of star and XN Newton. Uh, the source is uh, uh, very variable which make uh, the uh, data analysis a little bit more complicated, but I mean, you have just to uh, consider different, uh, split the uh, data analysis in different uh, spectral state. And I mean, I skip uh, all the uh, thing and go directly to the result. Eventually you have some kind of this result in the sense uh, for the uh, metric of a space you have to fit uh, typically many data. Many, uh, you have to fit uh, uh, many free parameters. Typically this system have uh, 10, 20, even more free parameters. And then, uh, well, you obtain a, a, your best fit. Your, I mean, you try, you, first uh, you uh, select the correct uh, astrophysical model. Then you find uh, the best fit, and you have this kind of constraint. So this is 
in particular is uh, the spin against uh, this deformation alpha the, this deformation parameter alpha one three and here I show for alpha one three equals zero you recover care so you recover general relativity and here the red green and blue curve correspond to the 68 90 and 99 percent confidence level curve and you can repeat this for other deformation parameter so this is an uh, example of alpha to do which is another deformation parameter and this is epsilon 3 which i mean these are deformation parameters that i show you uh, before in this uh, johansen metric uh, in general, as I said, uh, there are many uh, free parameters, so it is good uh, to perform some MCMC simulation because uh, uh, there is the problem of parameter degeneracy. And this is another good source, GRS 1915 plus 105, which is uh, a uh, stellar mass black hole. And even in this case, I mean, uh, you have to fit uh, the data and uh, I mean, uh, get the best fit uh, and then uh, find the uncertainty on your, uh, on your uh, uh, free parameters. So this is the zoom of a previous uh, corner plot. Again, I show uh, the spin against uh, the deformation parameter alpha one three, and I mean, you can get uh, a constraint. So the strategy is just to try to find uh, with good source, uh, good data, and try to get uh, better and better constraint, or even to uh, test uh, different uh, deviation uh, from care. Uh, in the case of uh, the thermal spectrum of the disk, we have for the moment only one source, which was analyzed uh, I mean, uh, recently, just because uh, we construct this NKBB uh, just uh, last year. And uh, it was applied to LMCX1, which is uh, a stellar mass black hole in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And uh, here you see a strong parameter degeneracy. And indeed, this is the spin against the same deformation parameter alpha 1, 3. The point is that uh, the thermal spectrum of the disk is a simple spectrum. It is just a multi-temperature black hole spectrum. So it is relatively easy uh, to find a fit. And so for this reason, yeah, you find a, a strong correlation typically between the spin and the deformation parameter. In the case of a, a reflection spectrum, there are many features, many lines, in particular the iron alpha line, and it is easier uh, to break the parameter degeneracy. But uh, on the other end, you, there are also uh, more parameters. So, I mean, it depends on specific source and uh, specific data. So, it's sometimes, even in the case of a, a X reflection spectroscopy, you can have. Uh, this kind of degeneracy, and in which basically you don't have an independent measurement of the spin and uh, the deformation parameter. So I arrive at the conclusion. Um, so this is just to summarize what uh, I have done in the past uh, few years with uh, my group at Fudan. So we have we constructed two uh, models for, for testing generative in the strong field regime with black hole. This is K, which is uh, a model to fit uh, the uh, reflection spectrum of the accretion disk. And there is also a public version. And NKVB, which is uh, a model to fit uh, the thermal spectrum. And we have analyzed a number of, uh, of sources and data to get some sort of preliminary constraint in the sense that this constraint can be definitely improved. Uh, for the future, I mean, we want to uh, improve uh, our test, uh, and uh, a key point is uh, for sure uh, the theoretical uncertainty and the theoretical model. Uh, I mean, in the sense, uh, of course, we would prefer to have better data, but this does not depend uh, on us. Uh, I mean, uh, it depends, of course, on uh, the quality, I mean, the, the properties of a, a satellite. So, but uh, we can definitely improve uh, the theoretical model, and here there is a list of uh, improvement. In addition, it is also possible to use uh, uh, both Rexel and K and NKBB uh, for the same source. And an important uh, point is the selection of uh, uh, suitable sources and uh, suitable data. Here, indeed, I have uh, a sort of uh, uh, desirable wish list of uh, properties uh, uh, for a source just to limit uh, the systematic uncertainty. But as I say, I mean, this is just uh, a, one, a work in progress. And uh, I think I can finish here. Thank you. Thanks, Cosimo. We have a question on the chat from 
Farta Sarati Vajunda, asking, why do you restrict to the thin disk approximation for accretion? Don't you miss out on many phenomena like jet formation? Uh, yes, this is a, indeed a good uh, question. Uh, no, I want to uh, to uh, restrict the attention to thin disk uh, because uh, the uh, theoretical model for thin disk is uh, is uh, quite well constrained. In the sense, uh, you can also apply this. Uh, I mean, this uh, some technique uh, for uh, thick disk, uh, but uh, uh, the theoretical model are much more complicated. You have to fit uh, uh, many more parameters. So in principle, you can. It is just uh, an issue of complexity. So usually, I mean, people normally think that uh, thin disks are uh, uh, more under control. But in principle, you can also uh, consider uh, uh, thick disk. Then, of course, uh, you, there is an approximation. There are some approximation. Of course, uh, uh, in the sense, uh, uh, even the presence of jet. In you, you can fit. Uh, you can add, for example, the jet uh, with uh, extra component. Uh, I mean, when you fit the data, you you do you should consider all the possible component. And uh, yes, here I describe uh, the uh, thermal the thermal component and the reflection component. But if there is uh, some kind of jet, you have also to take uh, the jet into account. Okay. Thank you. And there are other questions or comments? So if not, let's thank Cosim again. And uh, we proceed to the last speaker of the, of the session, Mr. Rahim Morandi. Rahim, are you online? Yes, I am here. Okay, can you share the screen? Perfect. Let's... Okay. I think okay. you can see my screen. Yes, yes, we can see the screen. Okay, let me... Where did it go? Okay, you can start when you are ready, Rahim. Okay, hello everybody. Please. I'm Rahim Moradi from Ikshanat and Sapienza University of Rome. And today I'm gonna talk about the inner engine of gamma ray burst, which um, this is a presentation with my collaboration, as you can see the list. Uh, the story is that Mm, as we saw in the talk of Liang Li and Wang Yu, especially the talk of Liang Li, there were many mm, observations of some GRBs, especially 1901-14C, which we consider as a prototype to study the inner energy of the, uh, the GRBs. Uh, why this is a important source because it reveals uh, many observation in the uh, jet in the x-ray afterglow in the uh, um, gamma ray and recently in the TEV radiation for the first time uh, observed by the um, magic collaboration so this is a very important source uh, which we can test our, our theory of the inner energy of GRBs. We have tested for other GRBs like 1304-27A, which have revealed uh, also very mm, good data, very reliable data. But this one has a, a more complex set of the data. So first I introduced the GRB 1901-14C, the observation and prediction based on our model what we predicted and what we saw in the uh, later about this GRB. 
Uh, then I introduced the jet radiation and the satellites of that have observed these GRVs, uh, which I have missed here. The most important one, the TED radiation recently by Magic Collaboration. Then based on this observation, I will introduce the properties of inner engine, which can explain um, this uh, uh, observation, this data sets in the, this GRV. I will go on with the um, uh, determination of the properties of inner engine, such as mass spin of the central engine and the black and the magnetic field around it. I will skip this uh, very fastly because I want to uh, concentrate on the focus on the uh, ultra relativistic prompt emission phase, uh, so called UP phase, and uh, going through the compactness problem in this uh, phase, uh, studying the transparency condition, study the behavior of magnetic field, uh, the mass of black hole, and it's been that moment, uh, uh, the why we have this such a ultra relativistic ground emission phase, why we have uh, this self-similarity behavior in these uh, sources or similar sources to this GRB. And, late, and the last part, I will mention some recent progress on the X-ray afterglow that has been explained by the this inner engine by with, but not with the black hole by the neo neutron star companion, which I explain how this uh, can energetic of the uh, such a neo neutron star can explain the X ray afterglow. So, in principle, we have uh, be before going on, uh, I must mention this that we. Uh, so we, uh, after having this GRB, we immediately went through the uh, analysis of this GRB, and we mm, predicted the supernova uh, explosion of this the, op the, the the supernova explosion of this source, and we predicted that optical supernova should appear uh, around twenty days, which the, the later uh, confirmed by uh, um, some groups that uh, confirmed that our uh, inner engine has uh, is strong enough to predict such a constraint on the uh, such an observation of the GRB. So um, what's the story? This is the, the almost all the uh, observation of this GRB, this famous GRB, as you can see the SWIFT image, uh, the SWIFT uh, X-ray afterglow magic uh, mm, data points, uh, Fermi LAT, and uh, Fermi GBM. There were many sets of data, but uh, in principle, uh, only these mm, data sets are enough to test our inner engine theory. So what's the story of the binary dragon hypernova of type one, which has been developed for many years in our group? The story, the very uh, simple story is that we have a, a binary uh, companion, a binary neutron star and a carbon oxygen core. This carbon oxygen core undergoes the supernova explosion. This supernova explosion since the uh, binary neutron star in the binary BDHN type one is close enough, the hypercritical accretion goes into the new neutron star and the black hole is form. So uh, we expect that the formation of black hole and uh, the presence of the new neutron star after the explosion, uh, which uh, give us the binary the uh, new neutron star and black hole give us the different component of this uh, system. Uh, but black hole will produce ultra um, relativistic prompt emission phase, will produce the JEV emission, will produce the TEV emission, 
and finally the new nutrient star will produce the uh, X-ray afterglow. As you can see, these are the satellites that um, uh, for the J radiation have been used, but here it, it have been report, have reported the J radiation for many sources, but here we use only the Fermi LAT. And for the TEV radiation, we use the um, magic collaboration, magic uh, telescope. And the, for the prompt emission, we use uh, we focus on the Fermi GBM satellite, Fermi GBM detector. So as you can see, the left panel is the uh, count rate of GRB 9114C as observed by the Fermi GBM, and the right one is the rest frame versus the energy of the Fermi LAT of the high energy photon of the J photon, let's say 0 0.1 to 100 uh, GeV. These are the results shown by Liang Li, the um, presence of the thermal component in this, um, uh, in the, from two second to around four second, we have the presence of thermal component. And as uh, Liang explained, no matter um, in which time interval, when we go deeper and deeper in the time, we divide it by more time interval, we always uh, see this thermal component behavior until uh, like the fourth iteration that the mm, sensibility of the detector allow us, we can always see this thermal component. Here, uh, later I will explain uh, in uh, inner engine, this thermal component can be present, this uh, small thermal component in time can be present around like uh, 10 to minus six second time interval as predicted by our uh, inner engine. These are the properties of the UP phase from two second to around four second. As you can see for the simplicity, we uh, fit by power law for both thermal component and the luminosity uh, in the UP phase. And this is the J radiation. Uh, after four second, we, as you can see, it is also best fitted by the power law with minus 1.2 uh, <clears throat> with an amplitude of uh, 8, 10 to 52 Earth per second. So what's the story? These are all the observation and data analysis that we have done for these sources and we have done for many sources. So how we can explain this? As I Mm, mm, told in the previous slides, the story is that we have presence of the black hole and supernova hypercritical accretion around it. So what can explain, what can explain this um, uh, inner engine in this, in this sense that we can have a black hole magnetic field around, accretion around, and all, all these things. Uh, we are currently working on our uh, model to, pre to present a better model, more realistic model of the inner energy. But um, with a very good approximation, we can borrow some models from the uh, literature. The first one is a black hole in a uniform magnetic field, as presented uh, by Papa Petro and Walt, this solution is that uh, uses the famous Papa Petro theorem that killing vector in space time uh, generate the solution of uh, Maxwell equation in that space time. So, uh, basically, 
this uh, uh, two killing vector that care metric has can generate the Maxwell equation. So if we demand that we have uh, the um, uniform magnetic field and using this um, of a petrol theorem, finally we end up with a wall solution that uh, will give us the, this is the care metric, the finally uh, if we use those uh, theorem and the uh, uh, uniform magnetic field outside the care black hole, uniform test magnetic field, we have the uh, this uh, uh, set of electromagnetic field around the black hole. As you can see, the, uh, but the, this, this is very straightforward to show that at infinity, uh, we have only the parallel magnetic field. Uh, and this uh, electromagnetic field uh, are highly relate, related to the geometry of our space time. Uh, for simplicity, we... Um, we use around the theta equal to zero, and uh, we show that uh, if we consider Q effect if is equal to B zero J, it's like the Kern Newman metric. So later on, uh, we can use the Kern Newman metric instead of this all uh, uh, wall solution to facilitate uh, our, solu our uh, calculation. And these are the configuration of the electromagnetic field around the uh, black hole. The story is that this black hole, uh, in this configuration, uh, will have the uh, non-vanishing magnetic field. Uh, it will have the electrostatic energy, which can um, accelerate the particle, which here we set our system that can accelerate electron away from the black hole and pull the proton into the uh, black hole. But in principle, we can uh, assume vice versa. But for this one, we consider that the electron are mm, uh, accelerated away from the black hole. So all these things will give us the configuration of our inner engine. So now we have an inner engine which has a Kerr black hole external magnetic field. So Kerr black hole has its own characteristic uh, rotation and the mass, and we have the external magnetic field. So we need to have a, a mechanism to, um, uh, to determine these three parameters of our inner engine. Here, I will skip this because um, there are details of the calculation. The thing that we do is that for calculating these three parameters, mass, spin, and magnetic field, the first thing is that we demand that after our UP phase, for the moment, I don't care about the UP phase. I use only after the UP phase that we have mainly the Jeff radiation. Uh, the Jeff radiation is dominated the so we demand that extractable energy of black hole is equal to the uh, Jeff energy. So what does it mean is that the rotational energy, extractable energy of the black hole is the part that ro the rotational energy, which I explained in the next slide, is paying for the energetic of Jeff radiation. And how we came to this conclusion, these are the famous uh, mm, uh, Christodoulou, Ruffini, Hawking mass. That mass uh, in the Kerr metric has two parts, the irreducible mass, which cannot be extracted, and the rotational energy, rotational mass, let's say, that can be extracted from the black hole. So as you can see that extractable energy is this total energy minus the irreducible mass, which will give us the contribution of the rotational energy. The second, the second uh, assumption that we have is that when photons are produced in such, uh, when we have the electron accelerated in this uh, electromagnetic field, and they, since they are in the electromagnetic field, they uh, produce, they emit the Jeff radiation. Uh, so, this Jeff radiation must be transparent. 
So the transparency condition will give us that, uh, uh, we consider that a 10 to 16 centimeter give us this relation. So this is the, our second condition. And finally, the time scale of the recovering our system must be the time scale of the synchrotron radiation. All these three conditions together will give us uh, the, this formula. Finally, for, for, for instance, for this uh, system, the black hole has the spin parameter of 0 0.4. The, and the mass of black hole is around 4.5 solar mass and magnetically is around 4, 10 to 10 uh, gauss. So this is our way to mm, calculate the parameters of this inner engine, this central engine of the, of the GRB, which we have the black hole inside. So these are the story of these three parameters. Uh, and in principle, at, after that, since we have the luminosity is the, from the observation, we can calculate how this uh, system is spinning down and how the mass, uh, the, the rotational energy is paying uh, this GEV luminosity. And as you can see, the left panel is after tilted 10 to 4 seconds in the rest frame, uh, the spin parameter from 0 0.42 goes down to 0 0.3 and the mass from 4.45 goes down to 4.4 solar mass after 10 to 4 seconds. This in principle can be done for all BDSN1 as you can see in this list. Mm, only knowing the GEV radiation of them and mm, the behavior of the gel radiation as, and the, the luminosity of gel radiation. Uh, as you can see for other three, I have listed only, I, I have uh, made a plot only for uh, spin parameter, how it is changing. So in principle, when we have the gel radiation, we can determine spin parameter, magnetic field around the black hole and the mass of black hole in the central engine of the GRG. So I will skip this. Uh, these are the story of the, um, how the system recovered, which is or not necessary here. The story of the uh, uh, determination of mass was enough to uh, explain here. Okay. What's the story of ultra relativistic prompt emission phase? Uh, when we extrapolate back the luminosity, well, we know that what is the mass and spin at the end of ultra, uh, UP uh, at the end of UP phase four second. So how we can know what is the mass and spin at the beginning? It's easy. Again, we have now we have the luminosity of the gamma ray, the UP phase in the Fermi GBM. So uh, instead of extractable energy paying for the GEV in this part, extractable energy is paid by the, it, it is demonst demonstrating itself by the uh, gamma ray um, photons. So we, what we do is that here we fit the, we fit the, the simply fit the, uh, luminosity of the gamma ray. We know what is the, the mass and spin at the end, so extrapolate back. We know that based on this uh, extrapolation, we know that each time what is the mass and spin. So in principle, we can determine again mass and spin at the beginning of the UP phase. And as you can see here, at the end of UP phase is 4.4, at the beginning is 4.5, and also for the alpha at the end is 0 0.4 at the beginning is the 0 0.5 so the story of uh, up phase begins here um, usually in our models developed for many years like i think 25 years uh, that up phase is the place that 
electric field is overcritical, and uh, um, by showing a pair production, we have the uh, uh, pair production E plus E minus, and then we have this around the black hole, the region that we have all this E plus E minus around a thermal bath. Uh, and this thermal, uh, and this region has been called uh, the other region for the spherical symmetric via the sphere and uh, for the Kerr Neumann metric is the other torus as it has been called. But in general, we can we call it the other region. So this the other region, uh, when it uh, happens around the black hole, because of the compactness problem, it cannot be transparent for the photon around this uh, for the this gamma ray photons around the black hole. So we need uh, the, there are a, uh, we need uh, this uh, radiation happens at uh, far away from black hole. So uh, what we are going now to do is that first we introduce how we have this E plus E minus around black hole. Second, how it has been expanded and uh, what is the gamma of the expansion and the uh, uh, baryon load and other characteristics that this um, the other region that can have. So the story is that when we have the, the, the region around the black hole, uh, it will do the self-acceleration and uh, it will reach at the point that it is transparent for the thermal photons. They will uh, come out and we, they will emit and we will see them. Uh, as a thermal component around the, uh, the, the in the as the thermal component in the spectrum of the uh, GRB as we characterize this one as a, a UP phase. So the beginning of beginning and the end of thermal component is the UP phase, and that's why we call it the UP phase because the other region cannot because of the compactness problem cannot emit thermal photon. So it needs to expand, accelerate at around 10 to 10 seconds, 10 to 10 centimeter. So, the, okay, I, 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 I will. Uh, this is uh, as you can see how our critical field we have around the uh, uh, during the UP phase, and how we calculate uh, the UP phase as I told you. Uh, using QFAT like 2B0J, we can consider that our inner engine like Kern Newman approximation. So uh, E of um, energy of the other region around the black hole can be calculated using this formula. It's, uh, it's very, it's not straightforward, but it has been done by, I think, um, Dufini, Rueda, Kerubini. I, I forgot to put the, um, the reference here. So, um, this is the story. We have this theodore sphere around an optical thick uh, E plus E minus. We'll expand, and at the transparency, we will see the photon. Using this uh, uh, simple formulation and the transparency condition, transparency condition, I uh, emphasize on this, and the conservation of energy, we reach. Uh, to this uh, final formula to see what is the, the after this expansion, what is the uh, gamma Lorentz factor of the um, photon uh, of the, this fire shell around the black hole. And as you can see, around 120 and baryon load around uh, 10 to minus 3 and the transparency rate is around 10 to 10 centimeter. And when we use the fully numerical, uh, they're in a good agreement with a fully numerical solution, which will give us around uh, more or less the same result. So the, the final point is that um, uh, the important point is that uh, this uh, these are very small thin shell. So the time scale of this thin shell 
um, when we calculate it's around 10 to minus 6. So it shows that if we had the detector that can, the resolution is around 10 to minus 6, we could see this thermal component going down to the time interval to 10 to minus 6. But unfortunately for our the, the resolution of the Fermi GBM at most 0 0.1 second, uh, we can go down, but still we can see this thermal component, this self-similar behavior that always Liang was talking about. So this is the uh, solution of the compactness problem. Our inner engine produces this E plus E minus around, and it will self-accelerate and it will emit the uh, thermal component around the, at the 10 to 10 centimeter with Lorentz gamma factor of 100, around 100. Uh, these are the transparency of Jeff photon in the UP phase. I don't go into enter. I don't enter to this, but the, the, the second part of the story, the companion neutron, new neutron star, recently we have shown that, uh, it has been shown in our previous work that it is paid by the um, new neutron star, the X-ray afterglow. But recently we have shown that using the um, spheroid and the change in the gravitational binding energy and the uh, rotational energy, rotational kinetic energy, we can explain, uh, fully explain the energetic of the X-ray after the glow, uh, even without the needing to explain the, uh, what is the magnetic field around the black hole, around the new neutron star, so only looking at this uh, macroscopic uh, um, characteristic of the system. So we have uh, been able to uh, uh, determine the initial period of the neutron star, the initial eccentricity, how the change of the gravitational and uh, gravitational and rotational energy will give us this uh, green the pole of the X-ray afterglow, and finally how the breaking index of the system will change. So this is the, um, this was the last slide, but before finishing this, I would like to show you another work that we are recently doing. Maybe this is interesting for uh, the Thesios uh, pro, the Thesios um, program. Uh, we are using the uh, artificial intelligence, the deep learning, and some uh, physical method to produce, um, to predict the redshift when the, there is no strong characteristic of the system like Lyman alpha force or other thing. When we have it, uh, we have this redshift more than six, always we have problem to predict. So uh, here we have introduced using this uh, uh, deep learning method, how we can uh, produce reliably the uh, how we can predict reliably the redshift uh, of the system when it is located at redshift more than six, seven, or even eight, nine, whatever, more than the, at the high redshift. So that's it. That's my that was my last uh, slide. Thanks, Ahim. Thanks for the talk. I don't see questions in the chat. So, is there any question or comments by voice? Okay, so if no. Questions or comments? Let's thank Rahim again, and let's thank all the speakers of the session again for their talks. This was the last talk in the session, and the meeting will reconvene at four o'clock, as far as I know. <laughs>